Hi there, folks. Um, people are still signing on, so we're going to wait for just another minute or two to get going. Uh, I'm John Surick, Director of Media Relations at the Bay Foundation, and we'll be uh, moderating this Zoom event. Okay, thank you all. Yes, John, while you're talking, you're not you're not full screen. If you know that, I don't know. I'm full screen on mine. I don't know. John is full screen for attendees. You have a uh, you have the panelist view, Will. So John. Is okay. All right. Thank you, Alice. Mm -hmm. So thank you all for attending and being interested in this. Um, all the reporters and all attendees will be on mute uh, until it's time for questions. This Zoom event is being recorded. The recording will be available on the CBF website about two hours after the end of the call. Today, what we're going to do is I'm going to introduce Beth McGee, our MC, capital GEE, -E, our Director of Science and Agricultural Policy, who's going to give us a little background on how we do, do this report and why we do it the way that we do it. Uh, then Will is going to speak. Also, um, on the call, we have Eric Fisher. Uh, from Maryland, Harry Campbell from Pennsylvania, and Peggy Sanner from Virginia, if there are any uh, state-specific questions that you all would like to address. A uh, couple of housekeeping items. Uh, reporters who want to ask questions should let me know using the Q&A function. That would be in the, the bar at the bottom of your screen. Uh, I'd like to know that you have a question. You don't have to type the whole question out, and who you, you would like to direct the question to. Uh, we're reserving the chat function for anybody who's having technical issues. If you're having a technical problem, use the chat function to let us know. Uh, so with that being said, let's get going. Uh, Beth McGee, give us some background. Great. Thanks, John. Uh, so there's only five years left until the uh, 2025 implementation deadline. So it's really essential for us to understand what's working and where we need to be um, improving. So in this report, we look at the three major Bay states, Virginia, Pennsylvania, and Maryland, which collectively account for about 90% of, of the pollution going into the Chesapeake Bay. And so to assess the state of the blueprint, we look at two indicators. Uh, first, we use the most recent version of EPA's scientific model, which takes the practices that the states have reported to them that are on the ground, upgrade sewage water treatment plant, and estimates pollution loads based on that implementation. So we looked at the implementation as of 2009 when the blueprint was initiated and 2019, the most recent year for which we have information. We looked at that rate of implementation and then we compared that to where the states need to be in 2025. Um, we do that um, for both the total pollution reductions um, that they need to achieve for nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment, but also we look at sector-specific progress. And this is really important. If you've looked at the report, you'll see that in many cases, or at least in the three base states where we looked, states are doing really well on wastewater, but they're behind in ag and stormwater. If you just looked at the total pollution loads, you would we miss that picture. So we looked at estimates of pollution loads. The other indicators we look at are the programmatic key programmatic commitments that the states have made in order to achieve those pollution reductions. And we evaluate whether they have actually done what they said they would do in their two-year milestones or whether they um, are falling behind. Um, so the purpose of this is we can look at the specific actions that they committed to take in order to get the job done. Great. Thanks, Beth. Will, your thoughts about what the results are? Thanks very much, John. Welcome, everybody. It's been almost 40 years of unfulfilled promises to restore this great national treasure, the Chesapeake Bay and its entire watershed. The Chesapeake Clean Water Blueprint is our last best chance to demonstrate that science can guide actions to save the Bay. We've seen some progress, absolutely. But due to Pennsylvania's shortfall, success is now in jeopardy. The Clean Water Blueprint is different from any of the past Bay Restoration Agreements. First, 
It contains science-based pollution limits. Second, state-specific plans are required to reduce the pollution by 2025. Each state must have a plan. Third, two-year milestones must be produced. They must be transparent. They must be monitored. And they are to track the progress in each state. And finally, accountability. EPA, the Federal Environmental Protection Agency, committed to impose consequences if the plans or the progress are not on track. Maryland and Virginia have drafted plans that if fully implemented, would achieve the 2025 pollution reduction goals. Note that I said if. To succeed, to implement, both states must demonstrate the political will to fund and get those plans in place and implemented. This will require both states to significantly accelerate pollution reduction from agriculture and suburban runoff. Pennsylvania's elected officials, on the other hand, do not have a plan that will meet the commitments they have repeatedly made to the Commonwealth's residents and to the neighbors, their neighbors downstream. The latest report from Pennsylvania's own Department of Environmental Protection identified more than 25,000 miles of impaired waterways, waterways that the Commonwealth says are harmed by pollution. That's 5,500, 5,500 more miles than the Commonwealth reported two years ago, a trend that's clearly going in the wrong direction. Furthermore, Pennsylvania's plan is not funded, nor are there any realistic hopes that the hundreds of millions of dollars Pennsylvania says it needs will be appropriated. All of which brings us to the question of accountability. Why did EPA approve Pennsylvania's clearly inadequate plan? This violates their long agreed responsibility to be the, to be the Bay Program referee, if you will, to assure that all states meet their obligations. The US EPA has failed to do its job during this, the final and most important phase of the cleanup effort. Is it too late? No. Can the Bay still be saved? Absolutely. There are a number of possible solutions. Let me give you a few. First, when the Chesapeake Bay Executive Council holds its annual meeting next week, its members can address Pennsylvania's shortfall and commit to their own plan as a partnership to get the Commonwealth back on track. Second, EPA can work with its federal partners, especially the United States Department of Agriculture, to establish a dedicated fund for Pennsylvania farmers. Third, Pennsylvania's elected officials can pass legislation to allocate funding to match the federal share. Maryland and Virginia already provide significant state funds for farmers to reduce agricultural pollution. Why not Pennsylvania? Finally, EPA, uh, not EPA, finally, <laughs> CBF will be preparing litigation to sue EPA within the next several weeks to petition the federal judiciary to require EPA to enforce federal law. Now, unfortunately, there's more bad news. 
Pennsylvania's shortfall is not the only emerging challenge to Bay restoration. The administration in Washington, their environment, the, the, let me say it differently. The administration's environmental rollbacks of clean air and clean water regulations are pulling the rug out from under the states. And as we speak, climate change is clearly going to exacerbate environmental degradation and make bay saving more difficult. The current blueprint will need to be supercharged in the decades ahead to keep the bay from slipping back. Now, some of you know I'm an eternal optimist, and there is some good news in the climate change part of the equation. Consider this, a healthy estuary, a saved Chesapeake Bay, is the very best line of defense for coastal areas to help combat climate change. John, back to you. Thank you, Will. Um, a reminder to reporters, if you have questions, I want to ask a question, please type it in the uh, Q&A function that's at the bottom of your screen. Uh, let me know who you would like to direct your question to, and we'll call on you and unmute your mic. I'm seeing no questions. Um, Dave Ress has a question. Uh, Dave, I think it's a question for Will. The question was consequences for missing the target. Can you unmute Dave? Yeah. Yeah. Go. Ahead, um, Dave. Thank you. Um, the the press release and the um, and and Will's comments actually make clear that. Part of part of the whole uh, idea of the blueprint is is accountability and consequence, and yet wasn't really clear what what exactly kinds of consequences are we talking about for a state that's not doing what it's supposed to be doing. Sure. So, uh, Allison, are you putting me full screen? Does it matter? Don't think it does. If you can hear me. Yep. Uh, one of the most fundamental consequences is that EPA can withdraw any financial support from a state that's not meeting its obligations. And believe me, uh, when they have done that in the past, it gets the state's attention in a hurry. Uh, that might sound a little bit cutting off your nose to spite the face when what they really need is money, but that is a way to get the attention of the elected officials. Second, uh, EPA simply using the bully pulpit, and they've done this again in the past as well, by calling out a state and saying that the state is not meeting its obligations has gotten the elected officials' attention in the past. And third, uh, and perhaps most dramatically, although there, there are other options as well, but the EPA can withdraw permitting authority under the Clean Water Act from a state so that the state no longer has control over various permits within its jurisdiction. Most of the Federal Clean Water Act is implemented by states. It, the, the, the feds will delegate authority through a permitting process or other regulatory means to a state to implement parts of the Federal Clean Air, Clean Water Act uh, and other federal laws. So withdrawing authority for a part or all of an environmental regulation that the states have enjoyed, and there's associated federal money with it, uh, is a huge um, disincentive if EPA were to put it in place. You're on mute, John. Sorry about that. We have another question from Amina. We have another question from Amina. Amina, yes. I'm you to go for it. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, all. So, in May of this year, um, 
Virginia, Maryland, and the district had uh, had uh, come out, the top officials, and said the attorney generals that they would consider suing uh, EPA if it doesn't force Maryland. And uh, Will was on that call too, and he also uh, suggested something along those lines. And I'm just wondering whether the, there is a 60 day period involved that you are waiting for before you can sue or what, what is the delay? Why hasn't it happened yet? Because you all are obviously very frustrated with Pennsylvania's uh, uh, lack of attention to, to meeting its, its, its share of the cleanup commitment. Yes, thank, thanks for that. Uh, I'm gonna, uh, thank you, Amina, for the question uh, so we can clarify this. So the first um, hurdle that we had to uh, pass was a 60-day requirement under the Federal Clean Water Act. If you sue the federal government under the Clean Water Act, you have to give them 60 days notice. And during that, it's the, for the purpose uh, of trying to negotiate uh, with the agency and avoid litigation, which we all want. Uh, we waited for the 60 days. We inquired of EPA if they would like to negotiate and the states did the same thing. We have heard nothing from EPA. We want to be um, overly solicitous of any response they might have. So we have waited a little longer and then, of course, with summer schedules, um, we're waiting, but we were prepared, and I think the states are prepared. We want to be coordinated. My guess is uh, next couple of weeks, you'll see litigation, but there's no reason other than we're doing it out of an abundance of um, a, a, an attempt to be fair to EPA, to give it a chance to respond and to perhaps avoid litigation, which they have shown apparently no interest in doing. Thanks, Will. Um, next, Hannah Northey, E&E. &E. Yeah, hi everyone, can you hear me okay? We can hear you. Great. Uh, actually, Amina asked the same question that I was trying to figure out. I wanted to know if the um, lawsuit that you mentioned today is part of the announcement that was made in May and it sounds like it was so in the next couple of weeks we're gonna see that we're gonna see that being filed possibly if the EPA doesn't respond um, I guess my other question is has have you gotten any kind of response from Pennsylvania uh, about this report um, and why their program isn't funded. I'd just like to get a little bit more clarity about what struggles that state is facing. Oh, uh, you know, I'll, I'll start and then Harry Campbell, you jump in, uh, Beth certainly jump in as well. And yes, thank you again. The, just to clarify once again, the, the May press conference was to announce that we were filing a notice of intent to sue. And I realized there was a lot, uh, you know, a bit of confusion. It, it sounded like we were suing, but it was the notice of intent to sue. In, in terms of Pennsylvania, um, you know, I, I might be a little glib, but a, about all I have gleaned from their rationale is, um, uh, you know, we just don't have the money. Uh, Harry, you want to jump in and? A, a little more precise than that. <laughs> sure, thanks, Will. Uh, so Pennsylvania's plan, as Will indicated, actually identifies a $324 million shortfall annually between now and 2025. And that is a reflection of decades of disinvestment in the key conservation agencies and the programs that boots on the ground like farmers, conservation districts, conservationists across the board rely upon in order to Im implement practices that are so critical to the Chesapeake Bay Clean Water Blueprint and Pennsylvania's plan in particular. And that is largely the manifestation of decisions that have been made and continue to be made in the state legislature. And as a result, we are significantly, as a commonwealth, behind in implementing the plans that we have promised. And as you know, 
plans are only as good as they're implemented. And without that technical and financial assistance to get that implementation on the ground, we are seeing the significant lagging and shortfalls in achieving the load reductions. And the impaired streams that Will mentioned earlier, of which are over 25,000 in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And I might jump back in just for a second, John, and, and just say that the financial solution certainly focuses on Pennsylvania. But as we have said repeatedly, and as we think is abundantly possible, we truly believe that the federal government has a responsibility to try to assist Pennsylvania in its financial needs, because this is a national treasure. And the federal government uh, for decades now, starting with Ronald Reagan back in his State of the Union message in, I believe it was 1985, has said that the federal government will make a commitment to clean up this great national treasure, Chesapeake Bay. So we, we believe that the money should be flowing more freely from Pennsylvania to help farmers put in practices, but also EPA, USDA, other federal agencies could, I, dare I say easily, repurpose existing funds not funds that have to be appropriated, not new funds that have to be appropriated, but existing funds. The Farm Bill administered by USDA would be the place I would start to, to Pennsylvania to save the national treasure and to help Pennsylvania clean up those 25,000 plus impaired waters. And John corrected me in the chat function. I said two years ago, it was actually a report from Pennsylvania that came out in 2016 that is now um, 5,500 miles of impaired streams more in a 2018 report. Thank you, John. Great. Um, Sarah Vogelsong, uh, your question is similar to the litigation questions before. Do you want to ask that again or do you have something else you want to ask? Um, I think you all have pretty thoroughly answered that. Thank you. Great. Annie Snyder with Politico. Uh, Annie's still on mute. Great. Are you able to hear me now? Yep, we got you. All right. Uh, so you all have clearly been preparing for litigation for a while now. I think back to January, I remember, you know, presaging it. Uh, the world has changed a lot since then. You know, we're talking about $324 million shortfall in Pennsylvania. That was a lot before. Now we're looking at a time when state budgets are really hard hit. Um, federal, you know, federal spending is, is in flux. There's clearly a lot of debate about that. I'm wondering at this point, what, what is realistic to expect here? If drought is litigation, that takes time. Um, it seems like it's going to be really hard to hit this 2025 deadline, especially when you when you account for the, the spending backdrop here, are you open to considering pushing that 2025 feet back? I mean, what, what is realistic at this point? And uh, Will, this question was for you. I'm sorry, I didn't say that. So it's the Pennsylvania plan, the way of achieving pollution reduction that has highlighted the financial shortfall. Uh, it's not up to the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, but Pennsylvania might find a number of other ways to reduce pollution in Pennsylvania without having to spend that level of funding. EPA might find other ways to require Pennsylvania to reduce pollution without spending that level of funding. But Pennsylvania has chosen to put a dollar figure on their plan that they are short. So we're simply talking about implementing and obeying the Federal Clean Water Act and just common good sense. Thou shalt not pollute your water and thou shalt not pollute the water of your neighbor downstream. 
This has been ongoing for decades. It is not the Chesapeake Bay Foundation's responsibility to assure that uh, the Commonwealth doesn't wait till the last minute when other states have not. So I, I appreciate the question, but I'm not going to put a dollar amount based on current economic conditions because I simply don't know. We, we don't know at the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. We do know that Pennsylvania's waters are polluted in all various metrics from drinking water quality to fisheries to human contact and on and on and on. That's not acceptable in a modern society. The economic benefits of a clean and healthy set of rivers and streams in Pennsylvania has been estimated by economists at having a value to the Commonwealth of, I believe, $6 billion or more annually. So I think we've gotten way past the argument that it's either the economy or the environment, when in fact the two are simply two sides of the same question. You really cannot have one without the other. Don't know if that answers your question. I didn't mean to dodge it, but I simply don't have the authority or the responsibility or really the wherewithal to say you could do it differently and uh, it will cost you less. That's Pennsylvania's responsibility with EPA oversight. Thank you, Will. Uh, before we move on to the next question, uh, Harry, could you give us your title, please? Yes, it is Pennsylvania Science Policy and Advocacy Director. Great, thank you very much. Uh, the next question comes from Steve Davies. Uh, can we unmute Steve? And Steve is on go ahead. Yeah, I'm not certain okay, who this we, question is there we go. To, but go ahead, Steve, and ask him. Yeah. Uh, I was just wondering, will CBF be filing its own lawsuit or will you be joining the states in DC? Thanks, Steve. Yes, um, yeah, we sorry. will be filing our own lawsuit. Uh, the states and DC will be filing their own, uh, whether the court chooses to uh, consolidate all the cases, which is probably likely. Uh, but even then, each, uh, each jurisdiction, each, um, uh, each of us would be doing our own litigation, our own arguments. I, I might also take this opportunity, and, and I'd follow, you can follow up if you have anything further on that, but I also might take this opportunity to say that the Chesapeake Clean Water Blueprint is in large part the result of litigation the Chesapeake Bay Foundation and several other partners did file back in 2008 at the start of the, at the, we've actually filed at the end of the Bush administration and then uh, negotiated with Lisa Jackson, EPA administrator uh, in the Obama administration. And the executive order which was issued by uh, President Obama became what is known as the Chesapeake Clean Water Blueprint. It established the protocols for the six states to work together for the two-year milestones for the EPA oversight, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, we've, we've, done, we've, we've, we've been there before. And I, I might also say on litigation, um, the Maryland Watermen's Association is joining us in our current lawsuit. And I should note that the American Farm Bureau Federation and the Pennsylvania Farm Bureau actually sued EPA and the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, we were full defendants in the case, to uh, asserting that what the Clean Water Blueprint was trying to do uh, was not legal. And that case uh, went all the way through the federal court system. Uh, the Farm Bureau's lost at every juncture, and eventually they appealed for certiorari to the U.S. Supreme Court, and the U.S. Supreme Court declined to take the case. Quick follow-up. Sure, yes. go ahead. Yeah, uh, who did you mention was joining uh, with you? Waterman's? Uh, Waterman? Yes, the Maryland Waterman's Association okay. will be co-plaintiffs with us in this okay. case. Thank you. Great. Uh, we're going to go next to Rachel Pacello. And then uh, I believe that Amino's got a follow-up, which we'll try and get to after Rachel. 
second. We are looking for Rachel on here. Um, sorry. <laughs> Rachel is unmuted. Oh, oh, wonderful. <laughs> sorry. Um, uh, yeah, hi. Um, uh, my name is Rachel Bacella. I work for the Capitol. Um, and um, this is for, for Will Baker. Um, I, I wanted to ask um, also about the, the pandemic and um, if it has um, affected or shifted your thinking at all about um, the approach to cleaning up the Chesapeake Bay. And what I mean by that is in the last six months, um, we've seen that a lot of the rules that we've been told are hard rules are, are soft rules. And we've seen that um, a lot, um, we've seen, you know, air quality improvements because of, you know, reduction to vehicle traffic because folks are, are commuting less. Um, I guess, you know, it, of the uh, past six months, have you seen any opportunity um, that you think can be brought to the effort to clean up the bay? It, it, it's 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 not the first time we've considered the question nor that we've been asked and I really don't have a good answer for you uh, the the primary element of the answer hinges on scientific monitoring of water quality in the bay and inputs of pollutants to that will that will affect the water quality scientific monitoring always um, is reported in arrears it, it it, it takes year, uh, a year or two or three to accumulate the data that are scientifically uh, relevant to, to assess a trend. Uh, we hope, as you said, that uh, reduction in vehicle miles traveled, uh, industrial output, whatever, the, the, the silver lining of a, an economy under, under distress might have some benefit, but we really, it's too early for us to say. In terms of other socioeconomic aspects of the pandemic, um, I, I, it's a little bit like the former question about money. Um, we, we, we don't think there's any reason to be willing to accept dirty water, dangerously dirty water in many uh, instances uh, because of the pandemic. Uh, so I, I'm sorry, I don't have a good answer. and. Um, I'll at least pitch it to scientist Beth McGee to see if she has any other thoughts. Sorry, Beth, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> anything you want to add? Uh, you know, the only thing I would add is I think um, what we've seen and I think everyone's seen is that more people are spending time outside. So I think that it has uh, increased awareness of the value of our natural places and, and the benefit that we draw from them. So I think that's another sort of silver lining, if you will, that, that hopefully people are more appreciative of the outdoors, of the bay, of the stream near their house. Um, and that might translate into the political will that, that Will mentioned that we need to, to get across the finish line. Great. Uh, thank you. Amina, you had a follow up? Hang on a second while we get you. There you go. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Who is it for, uh, yeah. by the way? Sorry? Who is it for, the question for? Oh, the question can be answered by Will, Beth, or Harry, either one of them. I just wanted to just just uh, uh, make sure uh, that when you said that you're going to wait a couple of weeks uh, to file litigation, uh, first of all, is that definite that you are going to? And secondly, uh, are you waiting to see if anything concrete is going to come out at uh, the meeting next week? Well, thanks, Amina. Yeah, I, I think it's unlikely that we would file uh, that all the jurisdictions. Well, first of all, I should say we would like all the jurisdictions to file together. So CBF and the two, three states and the District of Columbia. Um, I, I'm not the law. I'm not a lawyer, and I'm not the lawyer on this case. John Mueller, our VP for litigation, is so it'll, it's really all up to him and uh, his colleagues in the states and the district as to when they file. My guess is um, uh, that it would be unlikely we would file before next Wednesday. I believe the executive council meets. 
And until the day we file, if the states or the federal government or Pennsylvania were to announce a realistic solution to the problem they face under the current plans, um, we always would reserve the right to hold off on the litigation. So yes, um, we, we would not file if this were not an, imper an imperative for going to the very last step in the process, which is litigation. And we always view it as, as the last step. So with that, um, that's, that's, that's as good an answer as I can give you. Thank you. Thanks, Will. Um, Dave Ress, you had a follow up as well? Um, I did. I, I was struck, uh, can you, I hope you can hear me, but um, in reading the commentary on Virginia, there had been some discussion that progress with uh, wastewater uh, pollution reduction was largely offset by uh, increases in runoff, both from the farm sector and the urban suburban runoff. I was wondering if as a consequence looking ahead, uh, changing the amount of uh, reduction to be expected from wastewater might offset the challenges faced by reducing farm and city uh, suburban runoff? I think that's a question for Peggy, unless, Will, you want to take it? Oh. Thanks. Thanks, Peggy. So, Dave, thanks. thank you for the question uh, about how this is all playing out in Virginia. Um, you I observed accurately that we are having significant problems in both our agricultural sector and in the stormwater sector. And, and I think you also saw that Virginia is right now in the process of looking uh, with a hard look at uh, what should be done under our version of the watershed implementation plan phase three, what should be done with respect to uh, our wastewater sector. Uh, a lot of that is still, um, the, the WIP prescribes additional reductions from wastewater. That's in part because we um, are able to um, rely on their very good history of success. Uh, the reductions that they have been able to uh, 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 develop uh, are secure, are uh, provide assurance that they will continue. Um, but also because there's a lot more um, opportunities there. Uh, we see our best progress in the wastewater sector in the uh, Shenandoah Potomac watershed. As a matter of equity, um, we think it's appropriate uh, to extend some of that really excellent work down to the York River and the James River. So depending upon how this regulatory process uh, ends up, we may see uh, a larger burden um, that's being assumed by the wastewater sector going forward. Even if that is the case, and we advocate for that, uh, agriculture and our urban suburban sector will need to push hard. Uh, they, they have been working hard. Funding is always an issue. And as I think you're aware, Dave, we're looking at a general assembly session coming up uh, next week where um, the substantial investments proposed and approved by the General Assembly uh, in April will be uh, under scrutiny again. And we've been urging our legislators to take into account the multiple benefits that are um, arising from these investments. We have economic benefits and we have um, quality of life benefits as well as water quality benefits when we have investments in uh, all of our water quality programs, agriculture, uh, stormwater and wastewater. So funding will be really important. Uh, none of the sectors will be able to relax, um, but we certainly are looking for uh, accelerated uh, efforts from, from all three. Thank you. That is, <clears throat> that's the last question I'm aware of. Is there anybody else who has a question? If so, please type it into the Q&A section. Otherwise, uh, Will, do you have any closing, Will, or actually first Beth, do you have any closing thoughts you'd like to share? I do not, thanks though, John. And Will. 
Any closing thoughts you want to share? No, I'm good. I really appreciate the questions uh, and the, the interest and the attendance. Thank you all very much. I thought we covered a lot and uh, really grateful. Okay, and just as a quick reminder, the uh, recording of this press call is going to be available on the CBF website uh, probably by 1.30, maybe a little earlier. Um, in addition, uh, the report is at cbf.org slash state of the blueprint. And if you haven't looked at it already, you're welcome to. The press release is also there. Um, I also thank you for your time and uh, look forward to seeing some stories about this. Thanks.